into electron microscopes. You're probably wondering, what in the world is an electron microscope? Basically, we're using electrons that are moving in short wavelengths instead of photons, which are particles of light, moving in wavelengths. Now, question number two is, why would we bother? Electrons have a shorter wavelength than visible light, so you can get greater resolution. You can't focus electrons with glass lenses, it just doesn't happen. So we use magnetic lenses, electromagnets, instead to focus the electron beam. And generally, we can magnify from about 10,000 to 100,000 times, generally. Micro bright filled microscopes, we stop at about 1,000. So you can see we can look at things that are much, much smaller with electron microscopes. And there are two types of electron microscopes. TEM and SEM. TEM stands for transmission electron microscopes and SEM stands for scanning electron microscopes. So let's take a look at an electron microscope versus a light microscope. This in particular is a transmission electron microscope and you'll notice we've flipped the light microscope upside down so it has the same orientation that the transmission electron microscope has. Both of them have a source of the wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. In this case, it's visible light. In this case, it's an electron gun that's shooting electrons. They both go through the specimen. They both go through various lenses. In the case of the light microscope, glass lenses. In the case of the transmission electron microscope, electromagnets. And then the final image in the light microscope is seen by the eye we can't see electrons, so we need to have some sort of receptor that can pick up the electrons and the image. So we have a fluorescent screen, and when you're using a TEM, it looks like a TV screen. So here are some things that are necessary for a transmission electron microscope. First, you have to have thin specimens that the electrons can go through. And the electron beam passes through the specimen, and the dense areas, much like with the light microscope, are those that block electrons. So with the light microscope, the dark areas are those that have blocked the light. So here is a picture of a transmission electron microscope micrograph. So here we've gotten lucky and we've got a dis dividing bacillus that has been sliced the long way through. Here we've got them endwise and here we just caught the edges of stuff. So you can see there's a whole lot more detail than what we were seeing using a light microscope. We weren't able to see this internal structure. Um, oh yes, the specimen has to be dehydrated because electron microscopes operate in a vacuum. You can't have water coming off in a vacuum because that blocks electron beams. So we have a vacuum, you have to dehydrate the specimen, and that may create artifacts. Think of grapes versus raisins. You have to keep in mind that you might be looking at raisins and not grapes. Um, we have various methods for trying to keep our dehydrated specimens in the same shape so we don't get little bacteria raisins. On to the next one, the scanning electron microscope. We use the scanning electron microscope when we are looking for 3D images. So instead of having the beam pass through the specimen, we play it over the outside surface and we can get these beautiful 3D images. You may notice this beautiful color. Electron wavelengths do not come in wavelengths that the human eye can see. So the actual micrograph is always black and white. We can go in and add color and we call these false color electron micrographs and they're much more satisfying because we're used to seeing in color. So we see the entire specimen instead of just a little slice of it and there's still problems with artifacts because once again you've got to dehydrate these puppies. Now there is a different type of SEM, it's called the environmental SEM or ESAM. It was developed in the 1980s when somebody said, but I want to see live stuff. They developed a scanning electron microscope that could operate in lower pressures instead of vacuums. You can operate them in up to 100% humidity, which enables you to see live, unprepared specimens. It's really quite wonderful. 
there are some microscopes that we can see things that are even smaller than what we can see with electron microscopes. We call these probe microscopes. The first one is the scanning tunneling microscopes, and here's an example of a DNA strand. You can see the double helix there. Isn't that cool? You can see the sugar phosphate backbone. You can see the bases that have hydrogen bond. So what happens is you have a metallic probe that you scan right above your sample of DNA. It measures the electrons that are coming from the sample to the metallic probe and it can measure distances as small as 0 0.01 nanometers, which is pretty good. Now, to be able to use a scanning tunneling microscope, you have to have an electron dense material like DNA. We've got all sorts of extra electrons in those phosphates in the sugar phosphate backbone, and so that works. There are still some things that are very, very small that we want to see that are not electron dense. In which case, we go with atomic force microscopes. Here's an atomic force micrograph in which we see the enzyme that is replicating bacterial DNA. So once again, we have a metallic probe. That's why we call them probe microscopes. But instead of zipping this along at a standard distance above the sample, like in the scanning tunneling, Instead, we run the tip lightly over the surface of what we're looking at. It's kind of like breeding the sample by braille. And a laser measures the movement of the tip. And that movement draws the picture, so to speak. So we can look at bacteria clear down to individual amino acids. That's it for this topic. It's longer than any of the others, but we made it through. So here are reminders of the learning objectives for this for this topic.